Hello guys, I am Dr. Mukul Mohindra, your orthopedic instructor here at An Academy, and I welcome you to this special session. You know, uh, the clinical approach series that you know An Academy has planned for you. So, what's basically you know uh, the pattern behind clinical approach series? That the MC will be basically having some clinical pattern will be based upon images, clinical images, or radiology images from the field of orthopedics. Uh, they will be based upon clinical examination part, okay, uh, recognition of some things you use in clinical practice. So that is what I am trying to cover up in this particular series. So let me begin one by one, discussing the first up question here, alright. So this is a brace shown in front of you. So you have to tell me the appropriate condition where this brace would be prescribed so something you can know only if you sit in your clinics okay so that's you know what clinical approach series deals with so if you're attending your clinics you'll be able to pick up such kind of questions so there's a brace shown in front of you i hope you can see there's a chest pad there's a pad on the abdomen and the pelvis okay like this you can see Just tell me what is the appropriate indication is it for a compression fracture for a burst fracture in the dorsal lumbar spine or you use it in scoliosis Right, so I think things are back again. Yeah, so are you guys able to? There was a mild technical error. All right, so I think now everything is back online. So you have to tell me the brace this is used for. Okay, so sorry for the small technical error, guys. So what I've shown you is an ashy brace, A S H E, ashy brace, and this basically stands for anterior spinal hyperextension brace <coughs> and this is the brace that you use for burst fractures in dorsal lumbar spine that is the answer so basically when you have burst fractures your body tends to bend forwards you know when two vertebra would collapse like this is the upper vertebra this is the lower vertebra now if there's a burst fracture <coughs> the vertebra would collapse so there will be a tendency of the spine you know to go into kyphosis so these pads in the front negate that tendency to go into kyphosis so that is the purpose you know behind the use of this uh, ashy brace clear with it perfect now please do not confuse it with this particular brace this is taylor's brace this is another brace that is used for dorsal lumbar spine fractures when you plan to manage them on a conservative basis okay but please the, the two things are a little different please don't mix the two okay fine enough so i hope things are going clear enough my my audio visual is now going well because there, there was some kind of a technical issue i feel in the uh, beginning so i think you're clear enough so you've seen what an ashy brace is and you have seen how a tailor's brace looks like okay so I hope you guys are absolutely clear with both, them, both, of, both of them. You've seen them nicely and uh, and you are clear with both the pictures as well. Yeah, perfect enough. So I think now everything is going fine. 
great now great now all the guys so moving on to the second very very nice question so 60 years old female she's come to you the complaint is a chronic low back ache and this progressive weakness in both the lower limbs over last two months now there has there's a history of patchy areas of sensory loss also developing over bilateral plant respect since last two weeks so this is two weeks motor losses is two months so if you note first you had the motor symptoms here then you had the sensory symptoms here if you see the planters are up going so that means you know it's an upper motor neuron type of a lesion exaggerated reflexes exaggerated pictures okay because plant reflex is exaggerated which means that babinski sign is positive so this history of some weight loss over last three months also and the x-ray shown in front of you this one just see this area i hope you can see this lesion something wrong here so may i have some people telling me what is the likely diagnosis here serum creatinine is little high maybe but what's the likely diagnosis here all right monica says spinal tuberculosis absolutely right monica this is actually a case of spinal tuberculosis absolutely right because what you can see over here is a classical pattern of destruction that is called paradiscal destruction the moment you see this paradiscal destruction that is tuberculosis in the spine unless proved otherwise like what is paradiscal destruction i'll guys just let you know so you have an artery going like this it gives a branch to upper part of lower vertebral body it gives a branch to lower part of upper vertebral body and this indirectly goes on to supply the intervertebral disc now tb would reach the vertebra via the hematogenous route because tb was first settled in the lungs and then disseminate from the lungs to other areas of the body so when tb would reach the spine it would classically eat up this area it would eat up the intervertebral disc and it would eat up the adjacent parts of vertebral bodies so this classical destruction that tuberculosis produces in the spine is called a paradiscal lesion the moment you can spot a paradiscal lesion it is tuberculosis unless proved otherwise like if you see this x ray the disc gone and adjacent parts of vertebral bodies are being eaten up by tuberculosis see the lower disc absolutely intact the disc absolutely intact the vertebra absolutely intact so this is classically a paradiscal destruction and that means tuberculosis now how would a patient with tuberculosis you know present in a clinical manner now just understand behind the vertebra lying in the spinal canal you have the spinal cord okay now what is going to happen in tb that this vertebra is going to become pus and going to go back and hit the spinal cord so compression is going to come from the front okay akash i hope my voice is now okay so the compression is going to come from the front now just chart up the the cross section of the spinal cord for you so this is that h shaped gray matter and outside what you have is the white matter okay so this is that entire gray matter and outside is the white matter so in the front you have the motor tracts the corticospinal tracts at the back here you have the sensory tracts the fasciculus gracilis fasciculus cuneatus okay so this is the posterior aspect this is the front now the bladder bowel fiber tend to be present on the periphery right at the edge of the cord now whatever is becoming pus and going to hit back the spinal cord so basically compression is coming from the front so when compression comes from the front you classically find that first to go they tend to be the motor tracts so compression is going to come from the front you know guys pus because whatever is becoming pus and going back so first the motor tracts are gone then the sensory tracts go and in the end you get the bladder bowel involvement so that is the order in which you know your logical deficit goes in tb spine first you have motor symptoms then you have sensory symptoms and in the end you find the bladder bowel involvement and even when motor system is involved first you find exaggerated reflexes and then you start finding the spastic type of paralysis that you find in upper motor neuron lesion so this is the order in which neurological deficit goes in case of tuberculosis of spine so if you see this pattern first you had the motor symptoms then the sensory symptoms 
okay just in the same order so this is a case of tuberculosis you are well right so moving on to another very very nice clinical picture so i hope you can see this lesion over here okay so you can see the location nicely so may i just guys ask you what is the probable diagnosis looking at this clinical picture so clinical series so all clinical pictures clinical based questions based on examinations based on things you can get to know only if you sit in the opds yes so may i have some people all right monica says it's likely a lipoma one vote here anyone else who wishes to put some light on it so what else could this be could be a renal cyst because it's in that area retroperitoneal area could be a retroperitoneal hernia or is it something like a swass abscess all right another one over here all right uh, ravi says again a so i'll tell you why this is actually a classical case of swass abscess so i'll just show you what is a swass abscess see in tb vertebra undergoes caesarean necrosis and turns and the whole area turns into something called cold abscess now where do cold abscesses travel from the vertebra this depends upon part of the spinal column involved like if you have tuberculosis involving the cervical vertebra cervical spine then here you are going to find pre vertebral abscesses abscesses collect in front of the vertebra like you can see the c6 c7 vertebra the disc space is reduced so this is tb so this entire shadow here is the pre vertebral abscess now when you have the dorsal spine involved in tb mind you most commonly it is the dorsal spine that is involved now here the pus tends to collect on sides of the vertebra i hope you can see the pus collection here giving the shape of a bird's nest here these are called paravertebral abscesses so that is what happens to cold abscess when you have tb in the dorsal spine they become paravertebral abscesses but mind you when you have tuberculosis in lumbar spine especially around dorso lumbar junction which is a very fairly common area in what this is what you tend to find swass abscesses so guys these are serial mri images the image was there in the inac it exam that has just gone by so if you can just see this is the swass muscle vertebra this is the swass muscle going down to attach to the lesser trochanter where the idiosaurus attaches now i hope you can see this white white pus so i am going from the front towards the back so as i am going back i hope you can see this white shadow behind the swass so this white shadow behind the swass is the abscess that has tracked along the swass and gone right into the retroperitoneal area here to collect at the back this particular area at the back is what you call as that lumbar triangle of pettit so that is where the abscess finally collects is swass abscess so i hope you guys are clear with the course of the cold abscesses in cervical spine dorsal spine lumbar spine how the cold abscesses go different areas and i hope you are clear with how to read an mri of a swass abscess you can see this swass muscle but as you'll go back with the mri sections you'll be able to find this pus collection behind this swass and mri is al always read you know in a serial fashion because in mri you have cuts going in a sequential manner So I hope you guys are clear with it. Perfect enough. So may I know if a young boy comes to you who is less than the age of ten years, he says that he has had a painful limp. What would generally be the commoner cause? So what would be the commoner cause? You know, if if, I, if a ten years old child comes to you with that complaint of a painful limp. Yes. Yes, guys. So so may I have some answers? Akash, Monica, Ravi. So, so you all guys are there. So, can you can you throw some light on it? What could be the possible causes? Uh, less than ten years old kid is come to you with that painful limp. So, what could be the possible cause? Would it be Parthi's disease? Would it be septic arthritis? Would it be a case of something called transient synovitis, or would it be a case of congenital dislocation of it? D. Ravi says A. 
okay okay we have an option d d more people towards d all right so i'll tell you actually the answer here is transient synovitis transient synovitis some minor injury maybe you know child was playing somewhere and injured a little bit and there was a transient inflammation of the synovium in the hip this is the most common cause of painful limp in a child who is less than the age of 10 years transient synovitis mind you parthes disease is the commonest cause of painless limp not painful although you can have a painful limp in parthes disease but more commonly you find a painless limp in parthes disease i think you guys understand what is parthes disease or just throw some light on it as to what is parthes disease this is basically an idiopathic condition where you find a vascular necrosis of femoral head and this classically involves children in this age group 4 to 10 years so the age group was of parthes disease almost 30% of the cases tend to be bilateral okay no one knows the reason behind parthes disease but yeah since this classical age group is involved some people have given an explanation about the cause the most accepted hypothesis is the one given by trueta that's called the trueta's hypothesis so it is trueta's hypothesis here you have the profunda femoris artery this is providing metaphyseal vessels to the femoral head here you have that ligamentum teres and vessels are running in the ligamentum teres to supply the femoral head this is basically a branch of obturator artery so basically femoral head is getting a dual blood supply profunda femoris and obturator artery both now profunda femoris predominates after the age of 10 years and the supply from obturator artery predominates before the age of 4 years okay so if you can just notice this age group 4 to 10 years this is a transition zone for the blood supply pattern where the predominant blood supply is changing from the obturator system to the profunda femoris system sometimes this transition is not smooth so without any reason you will find the femoral head undergoing a vascular necrosis so that is why this particular age will for to 10 years 30% of the cases they are bilateral so likely a problem with the transition clear guys and yes if you are going to examine these people you are going to find the disease waxes and wanes sometimes they come to you with a painless limp and sometimes they come to you with a painful limp but clearly far more common is the painless version of the limp in parthes disease i must tell you the first movements that get restricted internal rotation followed by abduction these are the initial movements you know that get restricted if you are dealing with the case of parthes disease So I hope you have now understood this Parthes disease. I would definitely like to take you through some important X-ray signs of this condition. You know, because because often we are pinned a little bit on the X-ray signs of Parthes disease. So what do you see on the X-ray? I would like to tell you. So as the head necrosis, it collapses. It becomes flattened. This flat has has been compared to a mushroom. So that's the first thing you can see: a flat head. This flat head is called. mushroom shaped head i think very nicely clear in this particular picture this flat head mushroom shaped head now another very important x ray sign that you can find in this condition is something called a gauge sign so what do you find in gauge sign a lytic triangular area in lateral femoral neck like you can see over here and mind you this is one of the sign that's associated with bad prognosis also so very important sign a gate sign otherwise another you know uh, uh, another sign that may be visible is something called a sagging rope sign so what you have in sagging rope sign a sclerotic line sclerotic means whitish line 
so here you have a sclerotic line along medial femoral link so i hope you guys are all clear with these clinical signs the x-ray signs you know the x-ray sign that will tell you that you're dealing with the case of perthes disease you'll find a flat head mushroom shaped head you'll find a lytic triangular area in lateral femoral neck a sign of bad prognosis gait sign and you may find a fine sclerotic line along the middle femoral neck the second sign so these few signs tell you that you are likely dealing with the case of perthes disease and if it's a case of perthes disease the treatment it's a self limiting condition you know as that child will cross that age of 10 years the blood supply transition will be complete and the blood flow will be restored now children they tend to have growth potential pending in them so even if the head has become flat with growth the head will remodel and correct itself so we are just supposed to advise bed rest to the child so that the cute face can be tidied over so that the collapse of the head is minimum and it is very difficult to give bed rest to a child so better put him on skin traction for a few days so that is how we generally manage perthes disease in most of these scenarios clear enough guys and may i ask you a bad prognostic factor in perthes disease yes a uh, not a bad prognostic factor mind you mind you this is small mistake here the age onset more than it yes. this is the correct question okay so which of the following is not a bad prognostic indicator so all of them are bad prognostic indicators except you have to tell me that except any idea so i'm sure no one is going to say give a sign because you already know this is a factor for bad prognosis i've told you yes yes guys so so may i have some inputs on it Rahul, Monica, Ravi, Kash. So please chip in with a few, few, few answers. So not a bad prognostic factor in Perthes disease. Okay. So, so you don't have much knowledge about it, about the prognostic factors. No problem, no problem. I will tell you the answer here is a bilateral disease. Even if the disease is bilateral, no, thirty percent of the cases the disease would be bilateral. Uh, yeah, Ravi, you are right. It's bilateral disease that's the answer here. Even if the disease is bilateral, prognosis is not affected because, anyways, you have to give just bed rest to the patient. But all others, they are bad prognostic factors. Old age of onset tend generally tend to get bad prognosis. Gait sign you already know bad prognosis, and yeah, type C herring classification is also bad prognosis. So there is a classification that deals with prognosis in Perthes disease that is called herring's. lateral pillar classification and i'll just brief to you as to what is herring's lateral pillar classification see the lateral part of the head is defined as the lateral pillar you have to see how much is the collapse of the lateral pillar so when the lateral pillar collapses less than 50% it is type a when the lateral pillar collapse has gone to almost 50% it is type p and when the lateral pillar collapse has crossed 50% of the size of the head it's likely type c so this is a classification you know as you go down the classification the prognosis becomes worse it's a very simple classification so herring type c will also have a bad prognosis because there is a classification related to the prognosis so i hope you guys are clear with the uh, mechanism behind perthes disease you are clear how to treat it you are clear with the clinical findings you are clear with the x-ray sign you are clear with the classification you are clear with the prognostic factors clear enough guys perfect enough perfect enough perfect enough so i'm done with it so i've taken up a little bit of tuberculosis i've taken up a little bit of perthes disease in this session in more or less a clinical based manner you know talking about the clinical picture talking about the prognostic factors the treatment part the clinical signs the x ray signs so anything that was not clear to you guys may i ask you for any queries from the session if anything was not clear to you all right yes anita ravi monica rahul akash any any queries from the session All right. So I suppose there are no queries. So let me just go ahead and brief you a little about this this platform, an academy, a website. 
lot of more free material on an academy just download the app and go through the uh, or go through the website to find what all an academy has there for you to offer in case you wish to find me you can of course catch me up on an academy that's the best way otherwise this is a telegram group i run that you can join you can catch me up on facebook or even ping me on whatsapp if there's a personal query as best way to stay in touch with me is to go and join an academy and use this code to get your 10% off uh these subscription prices are very economical there's a small chart in front of you within the same subscription price you have access to all the material you can attend any teacher's lecture you can attend the same lecture multiple times you can attend some live quizzes also lot more to offer to you so we're looking forward to having you some of some of your subscribers on an academy and before that i think you already have an idea that prep ladder and an academy are now a joint venture so you can also go with the iconic subscription at fairly good discounted prices so see you guys any confusion still after the class the telegram group that you can ping me upon t.me dr mukul ortho so that is the link you can follow for any ready queries you have even after the class so okay bye bye good night